Hello, my name is Sarah. Uh, like Oliver said, I'm a freelance front-end developer from Lebanon. Um, I'm also a writer. I write a lot about CSS and SVG mostly. So I've written an, um, a CSS reference for Code Drops, and I've also recently co-authored the Smashing Book 5 for Smashing Magazine. And my last name is pronounced Swaydan. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the spelling is French and German, so I blame them. Okay, so before I start with the talk, um, I just want to add to what Oliver said regarding the handshaking. If you're a man, don't shake my hand. So if you're thinking how you should greet me, just either control your hand, don't move it, or um, just you can, the way we do it in Lebanon is men just put their hand across their chest in, in a way like I respectfully won't shake your hand or something. Or you can just not do anything. So I'm here to talk about SVG. Um, SVG has been around for a really long time now. It's been ar really around since like 2000 or something, but it's been around us and the web development community more and I think it started popping up mostly in like 18 months ago. That's at least when I, when I started seeing it popping up in articles and Google search, for example. And that's when I got interested in it. Now, even though it's been quite some time, it has evolved a, a lot in the last 18 months. I still get a lot of questions from people. In the last year, uh, whenever I'm at a conference, people would be very excited about SVG. But when, when, when we got to talk at breaks or something, everyone would tell me, OK, I'm really excited about SVG. I want to use it, but I don't think it's ready yet. My answer is always, yes, it is ready. OK. so. A while back, I got even a, a question from a very experienced developer, but who hasn't worked with SVG before. He's interested in SVG, but he doesn't know where to start. So he asked me, OK, the thing that I don't know is, when do I use SVG? What is it good for? What, uh, what, OK, it's, it's an image format, but I also have PNG and JPEG. When should I choose this over that? So this talk is going to be um, workflow focused. I'm going to be talking about design tips, things that you can do when you're designing SVGs. I'm going to be focusing on Illustrator, but the tips apply to pretty much any other editor out there. Um, we're also going to be go going over optimization a little bit and then tips uh, including spriting, a few tips about animation. But before I get into those, before I get into the workflow, I want to go over, um, first of all, browser support. Everyone is always worried about browser support. Browser support for SVG is great. Now, there are some certain SVG features where the, where, the, where the support is not really optimal, but it's being worked on. IE8 and below and really old Androids have some problems, but we have many different ways for embedding SVGs, many different ways for providing fallback for each one of those. So you really have no reason to fear browser support when it comes to SVG. Now, when would you use SVG? How is it useful? The rule of thumb that I always keep in my mind is raster images JPEG and PNG are usually the best appropriate for co continuous stone images such as photographs. So you wouldn't, for example, go photographing the Big Ben and then turning it into an SVG. I, I wouldn't do that. SVG, the best candidates for SVG format are interface controls, logos, depends on the complexity really, logos, icons, and vector-based illustrations. Now, all of that being said, there are some exceptions. For example, this image here, this is a perfect vector candidate. It's, it was created in Illustrator. It was, it's made up of vector shapes, so it is perfect for SVG. However, if you compare the file sizes, the PNG is almost half the size of the SVG. In this case, if the file size of the SVG is significantly larger, significantly larger than that of the PNG, don't use SVG. Use PNG in this case, use a raster image, and provide different versions for retina screens. Uh, using the picture element and the source set attribute, this, this comes, becomes really easily. So general rule of thumb, depending on the type of the image, continuous stone, photograph, illustration, logo, icon, etc., you get to choose whichever one, whichever format is the best. But SVG is not just an image format. It's not just used to display images on a web page. There are so much more. There's so much more that you can do with SVG. You can use it for icon systems. I'm going to be talking about this today because stop using icon fonts. Uh, you can use it for ad banners. Uh, Flash is dying. Uh, Chrome is going to be, uh, I don't know if it already started blocking it. Uh, Firefox already does. Um, I think uh, there was this guy from uh, Facebook or some. He just recommends to just kill Flash. So it's dying. Flash banners are dying. And HTML5 and SVG are the perfect candidates to replace it. Infographics, this is one of my favorite use cases for SVG because an infographic, all of them that I usually see, are basically just an image with text and shapes positioned in a very absolute positioning way. So SVG is perfect for that. And what it provides infographics is accessibility, searchability, and selectability of the text. 
SVG text is searchable, selectable, and accessible. And if you have an infographic that where the text inside of it looks great and it has all of, this, has all of those capabilities, then it's a huge advantage. Data visualizations. I'm not going to be talking about these in the talk today, but um, SVG is generally great for data visualizations, and there are libraries. Uh, the most popular one is d3.js for you know, dealing with the data visualizations in SVG. But uh, sometimes, depending on the complexity of them, SVG can be really heavy, and performance of SVG performance isn't really the best today, so sometimes you might be better off using something like, like HTML5 Canvas, depending on, you always have to test the performance. If SVG is too heavy, choose HTML5 Canvas, but the content of the Canvas is not accessible, you're gonna have to make it so. It's gonna take some time, but performance-wise, it's gonna be worth it. Animated illustrations, any illustration that you have, something cartoon-like, you can do it with SVG. And it comes with a set of filter effects like grade, uh, not gradients, we have those in CSS. Uh, blur effects, blend modes, uh, clipping and masking, and even, even lighting effects. And you can apply these effects not just to SVG, but to HTML. So SVG provides us with a way to solve a lot of our design problems today. Even if you're not using like an SVG image, you can use some of the SVG characteristics and apply them to HTML to solve, to solve common um, design problems. It can be used and should be used to create simple UI shapes and arbitrarily shaped UI components. Now, there is only one, I always usually tell people to use SVG to create shapes. However, I recently cheated on a client project and I created this. This is not the image that I created, but this, a triangle like this one, I created it using CSS by using this. This is what we, we've been doing for a really long time, right? I think that sometimes, if, you, if you're thinking about productivity, it might be worth it. Um, instead of going and creating an SVG file and then embedding it, I just chose to do this because it's, it was really simple. All I did, all I did was just copy-paste it, really. But, however, this is the only, the only case where I sometimes think that, okay, it's okay to just use a CSS shape, but we're always forgetting that CSS shapes are not real shapes, they're fake shapes. So they're not semantic, they're not accessible, they're nothing, really. They're just illusions. So anyway, in the future, we won't even have to do this. Uh, we're gonna get custom ads rules. These have not yet been spec. Tab Atkins is writing the, speci the specification for these uh, at, in, at, in the present. I don't really know when exactly. But a custom ad rule, we're gonna have an, an ad rule which is at SVG, which you can sh see in the slide here. It allows you to create simple SVG shapes inside of your style sheets. Separation of concerns, et cetera, et cetera, yes. But the whole idea is to create very simple shapes. Even if you can't create complex ones, don't do it. Uh, this example is from a, a plugin for PostCSS, which basically provides us, uh, provides us with the ability to use future SVG features in the browser today, even if they're not yet supported. So we'll be able to do this in the future. Uh, also, someone, after tweeting about it, someone created a SAS mixin, so you can create these simple shapes in SAS today, and the CSS spec is coming soon. So let's start with the workflow. The process of creating and using SVGs, integrating it into our workflows, usually in includes both designers and developers. There are exceptions. For example, if I'm working on an, on an icon system, I don't like ask a designer, I'm not a designer, so I don't ask a designer to, to create this, these icons for me. What I do is I use a service like Icomoon, for example, I download the icons and I do all of the things myself. But in most large teams, there are always going to be designers who create the assets and developers who embed them, animate them, script them, whatever. And because there has been a lot of controversial, uh, controversial, people have been talking a lot about the thin line between designers and developers. Should designers code? No, they shouldn't code. It's HTML, CSS is not development. Yes, it is. So I'm not gonna be talking about designers and developers. We'll be talking about a design phase versus a development phase. The, de the design phase is the phase where you create the SVGs in a graphics editor. Development includes embedding, spriting, scripting, and animating. And in between these two, there's optimization, which is also generally mostly part of the development phase. So design. I'm gonna go over some tips that are gonna help you create better SVGs. If you're a designer, make sure you pay attention to these because the way the, way, the, way the SVG is created in Illustrator directly affects the code that is going to be generated and that code is going to directly affect the work of the developer who has to deal with this SVG. So here are some tips that can help you make your SVGs better and, well, get them ready to, to be animated, scripted, embedded. First one is convert text to outlines or don't. Why? 
I see a lot of people sometimes converting text to outlines just because they think that this is, this is the better thing to do, but it's not always the better. There are certain things you need to know before you make this decision. Outline text is not selectable, searchable, or accessible. SVG text is, but if you outline it, you're basically t turning all of the shapes, all of the letters into shapes, paths. So it's not real, real text anymore. Um, I have an example here. I hope this doesn't fail me now. Um, so I have this hello generate text. And let me try to save it. We're gonna come to saving later, so. You get to choose if you want the text to be SVG text, real text, or convert it to outlines. If you convert it to outlines, you can preview the code here. This is what you get. Is it big enough or? So you get a real big amount of paths that represents just these two words. Whereas if you keep the text as SVG text and see it, you get this, just this one line of text. Code is much more readable, much better in general. However, there are certain exceptions. There are some exceptions. Outline text will preserve the font face you're using without needing a web font. This is very useful if you're using a logo, for example. If you have a logo that has text in it, most of the time, the, the font face that is used in the logo is part of the brand's identity, and you want to keep that, because what if the web font fails to load? And today, with, with content blocking mechanisms, some people may, may just, uh, I don't know why they would do it, but maybe they want to disable web fonts, for example. So if you want to make sure that your, your logo and your identity remains the same, you can outline text in logos. It's also good for lettering. However, depending on the font phase that you're using and the amount of text, outlining can significantly incre inc increase file size depending on the font style that you're using and everything. So sometimes file size can increase significantly. And as with everything, you need to test. Test file size, performance, what you're doing, make decisions based on that. This is actually the beauty and not so much beautiful about SVG that you have a lot of options and there is no, like, straight way to do everything. You're gonna have to make decisions based on your own workflow and what you're working on and what you can compromise and what you can't. Outline text is made up of paths, so might, be, might not be as controllable, controllable or animatable as individual characters. Similarly, create simple shapes using simple shape elements instead of paths. Simple shapes are easier to maintain and edit manually. Simple shapes are easier to animate using the attribute values, for example, we have a circle here, it has a fill, stroke, CX, CY, which is the position of the center, and R, which is the radius. If you create the same circle using a path, you're gonna get all these path data gibberish here. So if you want to change the position of the center or the radius, for example, if you're using the path, you're gonna have to use transformations. And if you want to transform the path later, later by animating it, you're gonna have transformations on top of other transformations, and it's gonna get ugly and complicated. So if you can use simple shapes, always use them. Simplify paths. Uh, this is best for performance because it, um, a path is made up of a set of points and the less the number of points, the less the path data needed to represent it and therefore the smaller the file size. Hence, better performance. You can simplify paths by choosing object, path, simplify, and illustrator or using the warp tool. I have no idea what that tool is because I don't know, I usually use simplify, but the designers probably already know. So you can use either this or that. Combine paths where possible and only if you don't want to animate the individual paths separately. For example, a lot of the icon services online that provide you with free icons to download, um, they usually, most of the times, at least the ones that I've used, they always tend to combine paths, even though it's not always recommended. Like if you, if you have, for example, a, a trash can or bin or whatever that has a cover and the body of it, um, suppose you want to animate the cover. Of the cover. If, if the paths are combined, both of them, you, you, you won't have two elements to animate. You're gonna only have one. So depending on whether or not you are going to animate them, what you're going to animate, either combine them or not. Combining them will make the file size smaller, but if you're gonna animate, don't do it. Fit artwork to drawing. This is again something I wanna do live. Um, if you've ever worked with SVG and um, you've embedded an SVG, but you ended up with a lot of white space around, for example, around the icon that caused you a lot of alignment issues and the size just didn't, didn't you didn't just get the size that you wanted, it's probably because of this. Um, so, oops, I've already done this here. Okay. So I have a path here. This is the most that I can draw an illustrator. Um, if you have an icon, suppose you have an icon here instead of this path, and you have all of this white space around it, by exporting it, you are going to get this white space as well. So if you size the SVG, the size is going to affect by this white space. In order to avoid that, you choose object, 
artboards fit to artboard bounds, and you get rid of the white space. Okay. Use good grouping, layering, and naming conventions. Um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but the layer and group names you use in Illustrator will be translated into IDs in the SVG code, so you want something that's understandable, especially if you're not the one who's gonna be embedding it. Make sure the coder, the developer, knows what they're dealing with. Make scripting and styling and editing SVG code easier, and it's best for automated workflows because there are some tools out there, uh, for example, spriting tools, that take your SVGs and generate a new SVG file out of them. So whatever naming conventions that you used initially are going to be used in the generated file as well. So make sure you use proper names. Exporting. There are two ways to export an SVG from Illustrator. SVG-Z, SVG compressed, or SVG. The last designer that I worked with, she had no clue about SVG. She didn't know anything about it. She just knew that she could draw something in Illustrator and export it as SVG format. So what she did, and she thought that she was doing well, uh, I mean, she meant well with it, English. Um, she exported it as SVG-Z, because, well, compressed is better, right? It's, it's smaller. It's probably better, but SVG is not editable, so I couldn't work with it. So all I had to do is I had to ask her to export everything as SVG. So choose SVG, not SVGZ. A compression is going to be done on the server side after you serve them, and that's outside of the scope of this talk. Export multiple SVG files using multiple artboards if and when needed. You can, use the, you can do that by checking the use artboards checkbox. Now, one or multiple, which one should you choose? That depends on the spriting technique that you intend to use. There are three main spriting techniques. One of them requires you, that, requires you to have multiple SVGs, one file for each icon, for example, and one of them requires you to have all of the icons in one SVG file. We're gonna go over those later. So if you have multiple artboards like these and you export them, you're gonna get three files, one for each one, and if you combine them into one artboard and export it, you're gonna get one SVG which has all of these icons inside of it. Exporting SVG for the web with Illustrator. Now, here are the options. Uh, these are gonna get a lot better. Uh, I got to give feedback to the Illustrator team a while back. Uh, they're basically trying to make the SVG workflow in Illustrator a lot better, so this is great news. Uh, when it comes to um, exported code, with ha which currently contains a lot of junk, hopefully that's gonna be cleared up. A lot of change is coming, I hope. Uh, so you can choose SVG profile 1.1, it's what we're using now. I think that once SVG2, I expect to have an SVG2, SVG2 option here too. Text, we, font, we already talked about it. Um, options, if you have an image inside of the SVG, you can either choose to embed it inside of the SVG or have it be external and link to it externally. That depends, uh, usually better not to link to it because you wanna avoid extra HTTP requests, but then again, with HTTP2, that's not gonna be a problem anymore. Um, advanced options, CSS properties, you get to specify if you want the styles to use presentation attributes or uh, style properties. And what I wanna focus on in this, this entire slide here is the responsive one. You would be tempted to choose responsive, especially if you're working on a responsive web design. You want the SVG to be responsive. And if you've watched any of my talks from a year ago, I used to always say that if you want to make an SVG responsive, the first thing, the first step that you have to do is to remove the width and height attributes. Because why would you want to have specific width and height attributes if you want it to be fluid, right? However, right now, what I recommend is always keep the width and height attributes and override them in CSS. If you specify styles in the CSS, they are going to override the presentation attributes, except in Safari right now it has a bug, but I hope it gets fixed. The reason why the width and height attributes have to be kept is, if the CSS fails to load for any reason, you're gonna have a fallback. Uh, I have a really slow connection back home, and sometimes when I open CodePen, for example, if my connection is really bad, it takes some time for the, for the page to load and for the styles to load. So what I initially see is a really huge CodePen icon because it doesn't have any width and height attributes. If it, had, if it had width and height attributes, it would be a small icon. It would be still you know, different to look at. Another thing, and the most important thing why you have to keep the width and height is that if you're using the SVG as a background image, scaling the background image is not, um, let's just say that Internet Explorer, duh, and possibly even Firefox, they have a problem with scaling the background image if, if the SVG does not have width and height attributes set. So in order to avoid those problems, keep them and override them in CSS. Um, the thing that I wanna focus on before I move to the next sections here is that designers, if there are designers and developers working on an SVG, designers need to know what the developer needs early in the project because every step they take in the graphics editor will affect the code developers have to deal with. 
seriously every step. The last designer that I worked with, instead, for example, we had multiple dotted paths inside an SVG, and they asked me to animate the SVGs, uh, the, to animate the, the paths such that each dot is animated individually, and you have to sync all of them together. It wasn't really difficult, but she sent me a file that all of these dots were, were literally dotted paths, so I couldn't animate them. I spent a lot of time jumping back into Illustrator and recreating each and every dot as a circle in order to animate them. Um, there are a lot of decisions that I had to ask her to change and to recreate things uh, just because she didn't know better about, she didn't know anything about SVG code. I'm not saying designers need to code. This is, I, I don't have an opinion about this. But if a designer is working with SVG, they need to know a little bit about how the decisions they make is going to affect the code generated. Good naming conventions helps developers know what, e what each element refers to, and exporting the assets helps saves a save a lot of time, exporting it correctly. Early communication is important and time-saving. Trust me, I know. Optimizing SVGs. There are many tools for optimizing SVGs, not too many, but the one that is becoming a standard today is SVGO, which is a Node.js-based tool for optimizing SVGs. Um, SVGO comes with a set of tools that you can integrate into practically any workflow. There's a Grunt plugin, a Gulp plugin, a drag and drop GUI, which I have here. Um, all you have to do is just drag your SVGs in here and they're gonna be optimized. I always use this for icons because it works. Um, there is an SVG Now plugin for Adobe Illustrator which allows you to optimize the SVG even further before you ex export it, an OSX folder action and more. However, there's something that you need to keep in mind that export, um, Optimizing an SVG using SVGO can sometimes break your SVG. And it's not just SVGO, any optimization tool. If you have shadows, if you have animations, do not ever optimize after animating your SVG because everything's gonna be broken. Um, another disadvantage to SVGO is that you don't get to know if your SVG is gonna be broken or not because there's no way of visually telling, which is why Jake Archibald created this SVG OMG, SVGO's missing GUI, um, last December, about a year ago. It basically, you just upload your SVG, select your SVG, you get to choose what SVG optimizations you want to apply, and you get to see if, it's, if your SVG is still okay or not. So this is the one that I use for more, more, complex, um, more complex illustrations, and for icons, I always use the drag and drop GUI, because they're rarely ever broken. Um, if you want a link to all of those, I've written an article that contains all of these, and there's even a plugin that was created for Inkscape recently that I've also added, so you can check them out here. Do not optimize if you're going to animate the SVG because optimization changes the structure. So suppose you've created the SVG in Illustrator, you have ID names, layering, grouping, everything is perfect. But as what SVGO does, it will most likely change your structure. Especially, if, for example, if you, if you add an ID to some element inside of the SVG, inside of the illustration, and you don't use it. For example, you're not adding an, a linear gradient ID and reusing it inside of the ID. If you just add an ID that you want to use in the script later, if SVGO sees that this ID is not being used, it's gonna get rid of it. So your structure is going to be damaged. So only optimize if you're not going to animate and do some manual optimization, getting rid of uh, editor metadata and stuff like that manually by hand. Development. Um, okay. So I'm gonna talk about spriting techniques here because like I said, a lot of people still don't want to use SVG and I still see icon fonts in a lot of places and they just suck. So there are three different spriting techniques. Um, the, number, the first one is, remember when I said that you can export either multiple SVGs or one SVG that contains all of the rest, artboards, using different artboards? So the first one, if you're, if you're exporting multiple artboards and you end up with multiple SVG files, to create a, a, an SVG sprite out of them is using this, this technique. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details because I don't have enough time for that. But the way it works is you have an SVG file, an SVG document. Um, inside of the document you have a set of symbols. Each symbol contains the, um, the markup for an icon, one of those icons that you exported. So you basically take the markup for each icon and, and you put it inside a symbol. If you have a lot of them and you don't want to do it manually, there are tools to, to automate this. And um, I sometimes, I tend to use um, iComoon, and what iComoon does, it exports all of your SVGs and it also provides you with an SVG devs file which contains all of the definitions for the icons. So you can just use it directly. Okay. Uh, since we're talking about code and before we move on, how to make your SVGs accessible, 
And if you're working on an icon system and you want each and every icon to be accessible, this is the way you do it. In SVG, you have a title and a description tag. These tags can go into any group or symbol or into the main SVG. And well, the title is used to give a title to the image and the description if you want to add a description. There's also the role image and the area labeled by attributes. These also add more um, accessibility. Now, if you have multiple symbols, you can, each, you can give each symbol these elements and attributes. And when you reuse these symbols and you know, use them anywhere on the page, they are going to, these, these elements are going to, to be copied with them. So every instance of the icon is going to be accessible. More about accessibility in these two articles by Leonie Watson. These are my go-to accessibility articles for SVG. Definitely recommended. So you have an SVG sprite with a set of symbols. To use them, you use the SVG use tag and reference the symbols. Here we gave each symbol, each symbol an ID, for example, icon Twitter, icon Twitter, icon GitHub, and then we reference them using the use tag. You can use that if the SVG is inline, you use the above, the one above, or is the, if the SVG is external, you can reference an external SVG and using a fragment identifier, choose one of the icons inside of it. Uh, this is not currently supported in IE, but it is, I'm not sure if it already has shipped in MS Edge or it will be, but it will be possible in MS Edge. There is a plugin for IE if you need to. You can always embed the icons in line as SVG tags if their size is reasonable and they don't have a negative impact on performance. Inlining SVGs is the best way to, to have full control over, over styles and interactivity, but they may not, like if you have a really huge illustration, and if you want to edit something in that illustration, I wouldn't personally want to jump into the HTML page to do that. So I like to keep it separate. Okay, so. We talked about icons, but what if you have an image like this one, like this robot, and you want to reuse it, have multiple instances on the same page, but you want to have each one, you want each one to have a different set of styles, a color scheme. You can't do that using use normally. If you would use the robot like this, using the use stack, you have ID robot one, ID robot two, and both of them are referencing the same robot element. Now, you cannot style the innards of the robot if you, have this, if you have this structure, because the contents of the robot, if you have these two elements inside of your page, the contents of the robot, all of the paths that make the robot image are being cloned into a shadow DOM, and you cannot select this, uh, the elements inside of shadow DOM using normal CSS selectors. So the way you would, you would do that in the future is by using CSS variables, actually custom properties also known as variables. So we have the first robot and the second robot. You have a set of variables. Each variable, uh, for example, the first three variables, variables define a color scheme for the first robot and the second for the second. And then you would inject these variables inside of the SVG. Actually, it works the opposite way. You inject the variables inside of the SVG wherever you want, and then you, you define the values in the CSS. What I want to focus on here is that all of these have both the fill attribute and a style attribute which defines, which uses the CSS variables. Why is that? Like I mentioned before, the attributes are going to work as a fallback. If a browser does not support CSS variables, it's going to fall back to the color specified in the full attribute. If a browser does support CSS variables and the, vari and the color value that you're providing it with is not valid for any reason, it's gonna fall back to the color here, inside of the variable declaration. So you have the variable, you have a fallback color, and you have another fallback for browsers that don't support CSS variables. This is how it's gonna be done. It's very flexible, but it's not now, it's in the future. You can read all about styling the contents of use in this article on code drops. Much more details than what I mentioned here. Now there's something new, again, being prepared for, for SVG and CSS. The future of CSS and SVG is really, really bright. So this technique using custom variables works if the SVG is in line. But if you have an external SVG and you want to specify as a variable color for that external SVG, it currently does not work. We, it, will be, it will work, we will be able to do that using SVG parameters, which are a way to set CSS custom properties on an external SVG. This gives limited but powerful, it gives a limited but powerful subset of the customizability that inline SVGs have to external SVGs. Again, this is something that is coming, it's not here yet. There is a specification, a link to that specification is at the bottom. It's coming, so. The way you would do it is you would reference an SVG, for example, like this, and give it a parameter function at the, at the end, and you specify whatever the color it is that you want. This is in case of the external SVG. The second SVG spriting technique, this is my personal favorite. I'm so excited to even just talk about it. Uh, it uses fragment identifiers. 
This is a visual approach to spriting SVG, similar to spriting, uh, spriting using a PNG that we, we've always been doing for years now. It uses one sprite that contains all of the icons, but instead of dealing, uh, instead of um, treating it as a document as we did earlier, it treats it more as, a, as an image. I'm gonna show you how. And it uses the position and the bounding box of an icon inside of the sprite to create a view for that icon. It doesn't make any sense, I'm gonna show you how. And you display each icon by referencing its view. So this is how it works. Um, yeah, I do have time. So if you have multiple artboards, and first thing you wanna do is you're gonna want to, you don't want to combine them, okay. I should have worked on the sizes here. Basically, the idea is you combine them into one artboard. The way you would do it, there is no straightforward way to do it, so the fastest way is to create a big artboard that contains all of the other artboards. Make sure there is no white space around it, and then you export the SVG, all right? So you end up with an SVG file. I hope I don't have any stupid tabs open, okay. So you end up with this SVG here. There is no white space, there is no anything. It's just an image that contains all of the other icons. And the way you would embed it is, you need a view for every icon, but how do you get the view? To get the view, there is a trick here. You can select, okay. you can select the icon that you want to get a view for. Select the transform a panel, and the X, Y, I need glasses, the X, Y, and width and height um, values here, you're gonna use them to create the view. I would, it would have been much, much, much clearer if I had time to talk about the view box attribute, but unfortunately I don't. Just make sure here that the transform origin is the top left corner here, and get the X and Y and width and height values for every icon. And then what you do is you create, you create a view using the view element. You give it an ID, for example, ID code pen, and the view box attribute, the value for the view box is the values that you get from the transform panel. X, Y, width, and height, all right? And then the way you embed them is, you would have an image, for example, no, not this one, the other one. You would have an image, and then all you would do is just icons.svg, the main image, hashtag, code pen. You're referencing one element inside of the SVG this way, and this is the result that you get. The first image, for example, I give it the hashtag of the code pen, the second one, the hashtag of Twitter or GitHub or whatever. There's another way to do this, again using fragment identifiers. Instead of using this, instead of defining a view inside the SVG and then referencing it here, you would directly define and reference the view here using the syntax. SVG view function contains a view box function that contains the comma separated values x, width, uh, x, y, and width and height. This is the visual way of creating an SVG sprite. It's very simple, very straightforward. Um, there are some bugs, especially in Safari and um, and Safari, so this is what I talked about. To create a view, get the position and dimensions. Uh, in Sketch, for example, you can get them on the top right corner, position, size, width, and height. Use them either using an SVG view or using a view inside of the SVG by referencing a view inside of the SVG. Browser support, um, if you're using the view technique, no, if you're using the view, um, I haven't memorized them yet. If you're using the, this technique, the SVG view, it's gonna work as expected in all browsers, but the second one has its limitations. It doesn't work in Safari as expected. So my point is, is, is you can sprite the SVGs using, the, using this technique and it works in practically any browser. Some of it do not, but you still can do it. This is browser support. Now, this is the third one. If neither of these two techniques compels, feels compelling, um, there is a third one. If you still prefer using icon fonts, please don't do it. Please just stop doing it. A lot of developers use, the only advantage that icon fonts have over SVG is browser support that goes back to IE6, but that's not even an excuse anymore. There's a third technique that uses icon fonts, you have all of the icons inside of the style sheet, browser support back to IE6, yay, awesome, right? No, it's not, because you can have the same thing in SVG, but also get crispier icons. How does it work? This is the closest you can get to icon fonts using an SVG. It supports back to IE6, no excuse anymore. Yeah, I have it. No more excuses to use icon fonts. So how does it work? Um, you, don't have, you don't even have to do this by hand. There is a grunt icon, which is a grunt, uh, 
Grunt plugin that you can use in your workflow. I, I'm not sure if, if they created a Gulp plugin too. Uh, there's a Grunt plugin that does it automatically, or you can use this visual tool online. All you have to do is just drag and drop your icons into the tool, and it's gonna generate everything for you. All of the style sheets, um, all of the images, even the PNG fallbacks. There's just one script that you add to, the, to your page, and it's going to take care of loading all of the appropriate. If you're in IE8, it's gonna load base64 uh, data your eyes. If you're in IE6 or 7, it's gonna load the PNGs. Um, you don't have to worry about performance. This has been created by the Filament Group and they are, they, have, they are really known for all of their amazing job when it comes to performance. So this is very performant, very similar to icon fonts. You just get the crispiness of SVGs. And it's all automated. You would use it the same way you would, you would use icon fonts too. You would have a class name on a non-semantic, well, a lot of people just like this, I don't know why, but if you still prefer this technique, you can have class name and the image is added inside of the style sheet, okay? Overview of all of the sprighting techniques that I mentioned is in this article at 24ways.org. Um, it contains also a little bit more detail for each and every one. If you still need convincing regarding icon fonts, read this cage match article by CSS Tricks, okay? They have no advantage over SVG, none. Animating SVG, one of the frequently asked questions, Smil, CSS, or JavaScript, which one should you use? Um, long story short, don't use Smil. Use CSS only for simple animations like changing the fill color on hover for example, and use JavaScript, I recommend the green sock, I'm gonna tell you why, uh, for complex, any kind of complex animation. Why? Um, first of all, Smil, uh, never, never supported in IE, not gonna be supported in MS Edge. Um, it's being deprecated in Chrome as well, so those of you who don't care about IE, I, I assume you do care about Chrome. It's being deprecated, don't use it anymore. Uh, CSS has a lot of problems, a lot of bug, bugs, a lot of browser inconsistencies, so it's definitely not ready to be used with SVG today. Uh, for example, this is the infamous transform origin problem. The purple is an HTML rectangle, the green is an SVG rectangle. Both of them are rotated, and you specify the transform origin to be 50%, 50%, which is the center of each one. Chrome rotates perfectly. IE and Opera don't rotate at all. They don't honor trans CSS transforms on, uh, on SVG elements. Firefox, it just doesn't accept a percentage-based transform origin. So it just keeps the top left corner of the SVG as the transform origin. It looks messed up. Uh, I think this bug has been fixed, but I'm not really sure if it has already shipped yet. So just to be fair. And Safari has a problem if you zoom the page in or out. Again, you're gonna lose the transform origin. Another thing, if you have multiple animation, multiple transformations applied to the same element and you change the transform origin for each, for each transformation, the one on the right is actually the default behavior in SVG. This is how it works. If you change the transform origin on the second animation, it's going to jump back to the initial position and then change the transform origin. So, so you're gonna get all of those unsightly jumps. You're not gonna get the result that you want. The, le the, the behavior on the left is the behavior that GreenSock provides you with. And this is why I love GreenSock. You don't have to worry about any browser in they didn't pay me to say this. I'm just a developer, I'm, looking, I'm always looking for the best tool and their tool is amazing. You don't have to worry about browser support, browser inconsistencies, even default behaviors that are unintuitive and that you just hate, they rid you of them. It's perfect, you can create really complex animations using just very few lines of code. I actually used GreenSock for all of the animations on the client project that I worked on. It was, it was, it was a breeze, really easy, really simple. Uh, this default behavior, it's, it's, what, it's what GreenSock provides you with, too. A lot of things, uh, you can do a lot of things, more control, smell, deprecated, CSS, buggy, ugly, use JavaScript, and if you're gonna use JavaScript, I recommend using GreenSock. There's also um, Velocity.js, the Snap SVG.js, but all of them lack the, the amount of control and serious, seriously, power that GreenSock gives you. So I recommend using GreenSock, and you can read more about it here. Sometimes I get too emotional about stuff. Okay, which embedding technique should you use? Okay, if you're not gonna be using CSS or SMIL, then your embedding technique options are going to be a little limited. Um, there, if you use an SVG, for, if you embed an SVG using an image or a background image, you're not gonna be able to animate it using JavaScript, so what should you do? My personally favorite, uh, I was once asked if you had to choose only one SVG embedding technique, which one would you choose? I said it would be object. 
Um, object is the most flexible and capable of all embedding techniques for most use cases. Uh, you get a default fallback mechanism between the opening and closing object tag. You provide any kind of fallback that you want for your SVG, text, image, anything that you want. Uh, you can style it, script it. Styles need to be, uh, you cannot style the contents of the object from the main style sheet, but you can have a different style sheet. I think that's okay. Or you can even access it and um, add these styles using JavaScript, if you prefer. It's the most flexible. Inline SVG is also great, but object is my favorite, especially if the SVG is really big. And like I said, I don't want to jump into the HTML to edit it, so I would have it separate. I would edit it any way I want. Um, a, a great example using SVG uh, is ad banners, and the object tag is perfect for this because the banner content, including script and animations, are encapsulated and easily reusable. So all you have to do is just put the object in the page, and everything is gonna, just going to work out of the box. Separation of concerns and plug in and play, I also already mentioned that. Recommended reading, uh, this is an actual case study by Chris Gannon, he created a, an ad banner using SVG, using, it's, it's an all SVG ad banner, he used GreenSock for the animations and fonts, there are some tips about fonts, if you're using, uh, just a quick tip, I don't have much time left. Um, if you're using uh, fonts inside of the SVG, the best way to make sure you, you get rid of all of the headaches, put the font face declarations inside of the SVG in a style tag. Do not base 64 them because they can significantly increase the file size and effect performance. So just use web fonts and put the add font face inside of the SVG. Uh, recommended reading, he has a lot of, um, he tells you about all the headaches that he faced and how he fixed them. Workflow tips, just quickly. Um, Illustrator, um, if you have an icon, um, for example, if you have an illustration, you've exported it and embedded it, and suddenly you, you decided you just want to change one element inside of it, but you don't want to have to copy paste the entire SVG again or export the entire SVG. So you can do whatever you want, and then select the element or the layer that you've changed, Com command C, copy, go into any editor that you want, paste. Copy paste directly from Illustrator into the code editor. I thought you would be more excited about this. The second thing is, if you have an SVG, no matter what SVG is, um, Brackets comes with a plugin which is called SVG Preview. Uh, basically, this is something I've faced a lot. I have an SVG and I want to change one element inside of it, but the designer didn't do a really good job about, uh, with naming them, with naming the layers. So what you can do is just click the element that you want, no matter what it is, and it's going to get highlighted. So if you want to change or edit or do whatever with an element, just click on it and you get visual feedback instantly. Um, credits, a geometric background that I've used in, throughout this talk is from Freepik. Freepik.com, um, a huge amount of resources, free graphics. I always use them because I don't know how to draw these things in Illustrator. They have a lot of resources. They're free. They only require attribution. And the GeneSap screenshots are from the GreenSock website. Thank you very much for listening.